thing. Right now, I think the technology is controlling us. And I think we, we have to look at ourselves and admit that. And once you've admitted te technology is taking control of your life, then the issue is how do you then take back control? You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, in a conversation that's being recorded on the 15th of July, 2016. And today we're talking to Dr. Larry Rosen, who some of you might be familiar with from his work before. If not, you can catch his work in a variety of places, like Psychology Today. Um, but Dr. Rosen is a professor emeritus and past chair of the psychology department at California State University, Dominguez Hills. He's a research psychologist, a computer educator, keynote speaker, and an internationally rec recognized expert on the psychology of technology, which we will be discussing today in the context of his soon-to-be-released uh, book that he co-authored with Adam G Ghazali, uh, The Distracted Mind, Ancient Brains in a High-Tech World. But I saw his work uh, on psychology today. Specifically, I was looking at an article called Are We All Becoming Pavlov's Dogs? about smartphones and how they are rewiring our brains or the way that uh, we are responding to this new technology. And all of that was before the Pokemon Go phenomenon. So it's extremely interesting that we have uh, timed this, this uh, conversation for today. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. Dr. Rosen, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks for having me on. All right, let's start with that uh, that article that I mentioned, and which of course will be in the show notes for today's uh, conversation, Are We All Becoming Pavlov's Dogs?, which begins by positing four scenarios. Scenario one, your smartphone buzzes. Without a moment's hesitation, you grab it out of your pocket and check the alert. Was it an email, a test, a Facebook notification, or just a random phantom vibration? Scenario two, you looked at your phone a few minutes ago, but now you're standing in line at the market and grab it to check for messages, even though your phone has not beeped, vibrated, or flashed. Scenario three, you posted on Facebook a few minutes ago, and although you have not been notified of any responses, likes, or whatever, you tap the icon and scroll through the newest posts. You see what, that your best friend from high school just posted a photo of her trip to Maui, and you smile when you become the first to like it. And scenario four, you're at dinner with a group of friends, and you have all agreed to put your phones on silent and stash them away. After the appetizer, you get up to go to the restroom, even though you don't really need to go, and upon opening the restroom door, you grab your phone and check the sports scores, your email, or whatever. Looking around, you notice that every other person in the restroom is doing the same. I do a lot of people watching and have noticed that we now spend more time with our faces staring at our phone than we spend with our faces looking at the world or looking directly at another person. End quote. Well, I think we can all relate to this experience, even those in the crowd who don't have a smartphone have certainly observed this phenomenon going on in real life. So let's start with your impetus for writing about this phenomenon. Where uh, did this start to pique your interest uh, from the perspective of a practicing research psychologist? Well, that's an interesting question because I've been actually looking at this issue since 1984. Before we had smartphones, before we had desktop computers, before we had laptop computers, before really computing was anything important, basically right at the beginnings of the Internet. And we started studying it. It was called computer phobia, which actually is laughable now because obviously nobody is phobic about their computer or their phone. In fact, if anything, they're obsessed with it and can keep their hands off of it. So over the years, we have modified the way we have looked at the world as the world changes. And the one thing that we have noticed in our lab over the last, I'd say, decade, plus or minus a year or two, is that we have gradually and slowly become so obsessed that we literally do look like a Pavlov's dog. That when our phone buzzes, we immediately grab it. When we feel a tingling in our pocket, we immediately grab for our phone, even though our phone may not be there. And funny anecdote, for some reason, two days ago, I felt that phantom buzz all day long. And I had my phone someplace else, and all day long I grabbed my pocket. And I know better than this. All day long I grabbed my pocket, uh, no phone, nothing there. So part of what we have seen is that we have become somewhat what I would call obsessed with what's in this little box, and we can't keep our hands off of it. We did a research study recently where we put an app on students' phones. And these are not your typical college students. These are 
older college students, so the average age is around 25 rather than maybe 19, 20. And the app monitored how many times they unlocked their phone per day and how many minutes it remained unlocked. Surprisingly, actually staggeringly, the typical person unlocked their phone 60 times a day. That means swipe unlock 60 times a day for about 240 minutes, four hours worth. And if you do the math, it's only about four minutes a shot. And so what are they doing during those four minutes? Well, they're either responding to a notification or alert, or they're responding more likely to a signal in their brain that says, I haven't checked in with my social media in the last 10 minutes, I better check in. Or, gee, I wonder if somebody, blank, fill in the blank. So we're basically looking at a society where we are constantly with our face looking down into our phone. And you mentioned the Pokemon Go phenomenon, which I think is very interesting because what people have noted is, while this is a very interesting phenomenon, I do have some thoughts about its benefits, um, one of the things that, that people have noticed is people are walking around with their faces down in their phones looking for Pokemon and bumping into things. And in fact, people have been injured. Um, I saw a, a spot on television last night where kids were running across the freeway looking for Pokemon. And cars were slamming on their brakes and swerving. And so while it may have benefits, um, this is just increasing our focus down rather than out to the world. Well, it's interesting to me that you raise the, the Pavlov's dog analogy, because it seems to me that from the annals of psychology, perhaps the more relevant piece of, uh, of history would be the operant conditioning chamber, a.k.a. the Skinner box, where Skinner found that the most effective way of getting the rats to press the lever or the pigeon to turn in circles or whatever is not to give a reward every time that a, a certain action is performed, but to make it almost random, that sometimes a pellet will be dispensed or wh whatever the equivalent is, sometimes it won't. And it seems to me that that has something to do with this phenomenon of notifications and uh, likes and this type of thing. We're checking constantly to see, oh, did somebody did somebody like my post or, or something like that? And it's the the random uh, uh, the, the random reward dis dispensing schedule that seems to be addicting people. Is there something to that? Well, first of all, it's interesting the way you put it because it's actually a little different. The best way to build behavior is to reinforce it every single time. The best way to maintain behavior is to reinforce it intermittently, ran like you said, randomly. So imagine you've gotten your first smartphone and you're very excited and it's really fun. And so everything you put, everything you tap, everything you press gives you something fun. In your brain, what that's giving you is probably a little shot of dopamine, maybe a little serotonin, uh, a little oxytocin, you know, a little, little of those chemicals that make you feel good. After a while, though, that wears off. And so now you're checking your phone and there's really nothing there or, oh, I really don't need this or this is not something I want to look at. But every once in a while, there's a gem. And so I would argue that what we're all feeling now is something on a continuum from pleasure to trying to deal with obsession or compulsion. Some of us get a lot of pleasure, so we're more at the pleasure end. Some of us get are dealing with a lot more of an obsession. We have to check in. We have to be the first to like. We have to comment. We have to be on everything all the time. We have to use our phone 24-7. That's more of an obsession. I think people are somewhere in between. I would put myself less toward the pleasure side and more toward the obsession side. I think I may get pleasure out of a quarter of the time I check my phone. The rest, it's more out of habit, boredom, um, anxiety, which turns out, by the way, anxiety turns out to be probably the biggest predictor of why people check their phones. So let's look at some of the, the darker implications of this, because it seems to me that whether or not there is a concerted effort to get people addicted to these technologies, there are certainly that that can be used as a way of uh, changing people's not only people's perception and interaction with the world, but the way that they they view their own priorities in life. Um, and we can look at the Ash Conformity experiments or the Stanford Prison experiments or things along those lines to find out how much. Our, our sense of, of ourselves and morality and what's right and wrong 
is influenced by the social dynamics that we're placed into. And when you look at something like a Pokemon Go that is training people not only to be buried with their heads in their phone running around the world across freeways, but also to passively accept um, uh, the, the permissions, for example, on this app, which allows all sorts of things which should not be allowed by any app, uh, access to your camera, but also access to your Google account with access to your email and contact list, all of this just being given without a second's thought probably at all by any of the players. And then you look at some of the players behind this app, Niantic Labs, started by John Hankey, who founded Keyhole Inc. back in the early 2000s, which was seeded with money from the CIA's Inkutel uh, that eventually got rolled into Google Maps. Uh, it's a bizarre and twisted world. And again, even if there is absolutely no dark intentions behind this, it is not difficult to see how there could be very dark intentions behind this. And this could at least be used as a template for future rollouts of even more privacy invading software. Um, can you speak to the ways that these, these types of phenomenon can be used against people to change their own perceptions of what is important in terms of protecting privacy and other basic rights? Well, first of all, I think that you're, protecting privacy is gone, um, and I don't think anybody cares. I think that's the bottom line. We arbitrarily agree to any, any privacy policy. We, I don't know anybody that reads them. Actually, I do. I know a 14-year-old who reads them um, and then it reports to his father of why he should or should not uh, click agree to this privacy policy. But, but I do believe that the reason we do that is because we're really intent on what comes next. And we want the fun. We want the interaction. Um, in terms of Pokemon Go, we want you know, the, the game. We want to win the game. We want to socialize. We want to go out and find things. We don't really want to read through an entire po privacy policy. And quite honestly, if you ask people if they care that, that uh, the app has access to their Google Mail, they'll probably say, not really, not knowing what that means. And what that means is, is that the app could certainly email everybody with an ad. Um, I think it's sort of fascinating how, how privacy has sort of snuck up on us. Um, one of the things I noticed, for example, the other day, um, I was looking for a, on my computer, I was looking for a company who would come and take away um, a, an old used barbecue. It seemed like a simple thing. I found, I went, found a couple companies. I found one. I emailed them. The next time I picked up my phone, right in the middle of my phone was an ad for that company. And we have noticed in my household that anytime you shop for something, Anytime you get on Amazon and look for something, anytime you get on Yelp and look for a review, anytime you get on TripAdvisor and look for a flight or for a lodging or something, you start immediately getting advertisements for that. Do we think that's bad? I think sometimes we giggle at it, like, oh, cute, we just, you know, we just called the junk place to call it away, and look, here's an advertisement for them. How cute. I think if you thought more deeply about that, you'd realize that that's all, all part of this mechanism that when you opt in, you're opting into everything. And yet, in most of the research on privacy, people say they don't really care. And I think, as you kind of intimated, this could come back and bite you. Right now, I think it isn't. Right now, I think it's being used in ways that maybe you don't like, that might be annoying. Um, you're getting advertisements a lot. Um, you're seeing ads on the side of Facebook, for example. Uh, you're seeing these ads pop up. But they're really not obtrusive. They're not bothering your life. When they start bothering your life, I think that's when you're going to start to take notice. Uh, and I think that is coming at some point. I mean, there are always people pushing that boundary. And uh, I, I don't know if there is any putting the, uh, the cap back on the tube, or the toothpaste tube, putting the, uh, the genie back in the bottle at this point. Um, so I guess the question is, at the very least, how do we mitigate some of these effects? And you do address this in your article and in your work generally. So let's talk about some of the ways that people who find themselves on this scale somewhere from pleasure to obsession, checking their uh, smartphone multiple times a day, can start to at least 
bring this under some sort of conscious control. And you, uh, you have a few examples of, of things that people can do here in this article. Try to slowly wean yourself off the need to respond automatically to alerts and notifications. Uh, check your messages on a time schedule rather than randomly. Do, uh, do not work with technology for more than 90 minutes at a time. That's actually a good one for me because I'm usually at the computer all day long. Uh, using technology at night ruins your sleep. Um, these are some basic things that people can start thinking about. Talk a little bit more about the ways that people can try to take this under their own control. Well, that's, I think, the important thing. Right now, I think the technology is controlling us. And I think we, we have to look at ourselves and admit that. And once you've admitted te technology is taking control of your life, then the issue is how do you then take back control? And I do want to say that we didn't get here quickly. This is not something that happened overnight. This is something that happened slowly over a period of years, maybe even decades. I mean, if you think about communication, for example, when in the old days, and I mean old days when I was growing up, you got a phone call and the phone rang and rang and rang and meant nobody was home. So you called back. Then maybe people got an answer machine and you left an answer, but the assumption was is that if you left a... Um, a message that they would answer it maybe when they got home at night or maybe the next morning or the next afternoon or whatever. All of a sudden, now you could call in for your messages on the phone and people had expectations that you should answer it a little more quickly. And then you got email and ding, you got mail. And now the expectation was you were going to answer very quickly. And then you got text messages and then you got, and, and what we've seen is it spiraled out of control such that that we literally now feel that we must respond immediately to any message on any modality. And I can tell you how difficult it is to not do that, and I can give you an exercise to try. Put your phone to the side, and the next time your phone beeps, don't look at it, don't touch it, don't go near it, and wait for five minutes. That five minutes will seem like a decade, because we don't know how to do that anymore. So one of the solutions is, since we didn't get here quickly, let's not expect to bow out quickly. Let's expect to back out slowly. And I don't want you to back out from technology completely, because quite honestly, I love technology. It's wonderful. It has great things to offer. I just don't want you driven by the technology. I want you to drive it yourself. So one of the ways is something that's very simple. I call it a technology break or a tech break. And what you do is imagine the typical person who has, I'm, I'm sitting in front of my laptop and my phone's right next to me, so I'm a typical person. What I would do is say, okay, I have one minute to check any websites on my screen, any websites on my phone, then shut down the websites on my screen, which means I would have to shut down my email, I'd have to shut down my Facebook, any website that would give you notifications. So I'd have to shut them all down, basically, because <laughs> I have web... I have Twitter, I have Facebook, I have email, I have all these that, that constantly ping me during the day. So shut them all down. Don't minimize them because if you minimize them, they're sitting there looking at you and, and reminding you and alerting you without alerting you. Um, take your phone, turn it on silent, set an alarm for 15 minutes, turn it upside down, but put it right in front of your face. The reason you put it in front of your face is it acts as a stimulus to your brain that says, don't worry, you'll get to me in however many minutes I set it for. I recommend that since our research shows that people check in about every 15 minutes, that you start by setting it for 15 minutes. Let's make it simple. When the alarm goes off, you give yourself one minute, you check everything again, close everything down again, 15 minutes, on, off, on, off. Once you get to the point where 15 minutes is easy, and you know, by the way, it's easy because the alarm will go off and you'll go, wait, I'm still in the middle of something I need to keep writing, or I need to keep reading, or I need to keep this, doing this email before I check. Once you get to that point, 20 minutes, maybe 25, maybe 30. I think if most people can get to 30 and have a minute to check in at the beginning, 30 minutes of focus attention time, a minute to check in, 30 minutes of focus, that you're doing great. And it works. And what it does is it basically eases you back off slowly. The one caveat is you have to tell everybody else in your universe that you're doing this. Because if you don't, you're going to start getting very angry texts. Are you mad at me? I texted you two minutes ago and you didn't respond. I liked your thing on Facebook and you didn't comment. What's wrong? Are you okay? So you get these comments that because people have gotten used to you being Pavlov's dog. And so you have to back off and you have to let everybody know you're backing off. 
It is a strange world that we suddenly find ourselves in, or not so suddenly, as you point out. We have been uh, on this path for decades now, and we're really starting to see the effects, and I think we can play it out in our minds for from this point to see how much worse it could get if we don't start taking those steps to bring it back under our control. That's why this work is so very important. I will direct people to your website, drlarryrosen.com, that's drlarryrosen.com. And of course, we're looking forward to the release of The Distracted Mind. So hopefully we can have you back on in the future to continue talking about this important subject. Uh, Dr. Larry Rosen, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having me. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.